असतोमा सत्कमय तमसोमा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय आवीरावीर्मेधी रुद्रय ते दक्षिण मुखम तेन मि नि मे द डिवाइन लीडर्स फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल फ्रॉम डार्कनेस टू लाइट फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोर्टैलिटी with the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us namaskar everyone my name is oishi dara and today i'll be singing a song called dub 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 rup shagore dub 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 rup shagore amar mon dub 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 rup shagore amar mon तोला तोल पातल खुजले तोला तोल पातल खुजले पाबीरे प्रेम रत्न धन पाबीरे प्रेम रत्न धन डुब 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 रूप सागरे अमर मन डुब 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 रूप सागरे अमर मन खुज 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 खुजले पाबीरे धन जे वृंदावन खुज 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 खुजले पाबीरे धन जे वृंदावन दीप 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 कैनेर पती दीप 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 कैनेर पती चल बे ही दे ओनु कौन चल बे ही दे ओनु कौन डुब 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 रूप शगुरे अमर मोन डुब 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 रूप शगुरे अमर मोन डंग 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 आई डिंगे चलाए अमर शिकुन जो डंग 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 आई डिंगे चलाए अमर शिकुन जो थैंक यू thank you for that song <clears throat> so we will continue where we left off yesterday <clears throat> so we begin with verse 19 <clears throat> yasya sarve samarambhah kama sankalpa varjitah ज्ञानाग्निदर्माण तमाहु पंडित बुधाज अंडरटेकिंग्स आर ऑल डिवॉइड ऑफ प्लैन एंड डिजायर फॉर रिजल्ट एंड हुज एक्शन आर बर्ट बाय द फायर ऑफ नॉलेज हिम द सेज इज कॉल वाइज सो दिस कैन बी लिटिल प्रॉब्लमैटिक हाउ कैन how can our work be done devoid of any plan or desire for results <clears throat> at present this might seem to be a completely impossible task because whenever we do something we all do have some plan and there is some motivation behind whatever it is that we do but there is a higher way of looking at things itself and that is and this idea will become clearer further in this chapter when it discusses the idea of yajna or sac cosmic sacrifice and that is that depending on the different stages of life and that was discussed yesterday about the the four fold divisions of society the different duties and responsibilities come to us sometimes that could be according to the different stages of our life it could also be to the different responsibilities we have in the communities in which we live and at different ways different duties and responsibilities come to us and of course we need to carry them out plans and desires come more 
when there is a strong ego involved. And the word, the word plan here is used is not in the general sense in which we use the word plan in English. It's a sankalpa. Sankalpa in the sense that uh, uh, this is what I am going to do. So there is this I. Ego is one of the central features in sankalpa. And of course, kama. Kama sankalpa varjitaha. So desire and sankalpa both need an I. But a stage is reached in the life of every spiritual seeker when this I doesn't remain limited to the individual. That this I gets connected to a higher divine reality. And then, then this I takes a very different form. Then the Bhakta says, God, let me do what I will do. Like Sri Ramakrishna used to say, that God, I am the machine, you are the operator. So what Sri Ramakrishna was saying was, it's not my plan, my sankalpa that I am trying to put into action. It is whatever is the God's will. I am just an instrument. So when I become an instrument, then I'm not doing anything according to my little plan or my little desire. I'm just an instrument to carry out the will of God. Now, we don't generally use the word desire of God, but essentially it's the will of God. And that's what is meant here. Only when a person is able to do that, whose actions are burnt by the fire of knowledge. Now, how can actions be burnt? So, although it says, um, Sarva Karmani Dagdham, the, the, the actions are burnt, but what is really meant here is that the one who is doing the action is burnt. And one who is doing the action, the karta, the doer of action is the ego. When the ego sense goes away, then, then the karta, karma, the, that, that kind of a division itself gets removed, gets eliminated. And so karma is, I mean, essentially it's like this. When we say, how does knowledge burn away all karma? No, what knowledge does, it doesn't burn the karma. It actually eliminates the ego, eliminates the agent of action. And if the agent of action is absent, then of course, who will get the karma fall? The, the experiencer and the agent are one and the same. And if the ego has gone, there is neither anybody to do the karma nor anybody to experience the result of karma. And that is why this karma is just cannot stand on its own. That's why they call it the Sanskrit word is triputi. The karma, karta, and the, 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 the object of action, they all kind of stand together. If one of them is removed, others cannot stand on their own. And that is why such a person who is able to subsume their own individual will and individual uh, desire and say, I just become an instrument in the hands of the divine. Such a person, the sages call, are wise. <laughs> Verse 20. Tyatva karma phala sangam nitya trupto nirashrayaha karmanya bhi pravruttopi Forsaking the clinging to fruits of action, ever satisfied, depending on nothing, though engaged in action, he does not do anything. Now all these are quite high states of practice. And all of us, what we can do right now is try as much as it is humanly possible to try to live up to these standards. Forsaking the clinging to fruits of action. Now, some, and this is something I have mentioned before, and that is not seeking the fruits of action does not mean that you won't get the fruits of action. It just means you are not seeking it. And as I give the example, if it's going to rain today, 
whether I, if, I can say I'm not seeking rain. Well, even if I'm not seeking rain, if it's going to rain, it's going to rain. So if I do some karma, even if I'm not seeking it, karma phala will come. And if it comes, I then have the freedom. It's like, it's like a meal comes to you served on a plate. Now, just because it is in a plate in front of you, no one is forcing you to eat it. So you see that um, um, karma will do its job. Prakriti will do its job. Every karma that I do, it will bring and karma fall is almost like this different dishes served on a plate. And so karma fall is kind of put on our plate. Nobody is forcing us to eat it. We can just say, look at it and say, okay, not interested. But if there are these fine things on the plate, then we will say, oh, let me just taste this and see. And maybe you taste a little bit and say, oh, it's it's sweet. It's, it's delicious. Let me take some more. And then we start eating. And then suddenly something extremely bitter, something not very tasty, something comes in the plate and say, oh, this is not tasty at all. And then you say, no, no, I don't want to eat it. And so the plate is still there filled with food in front of you. And you have got some bitter taste and you, you're not interested. So you just leave it there. But after some time, the mind begins to think, this one thing is bitter doesn't mean everything else is bad. Let me try something else. And then I try something else. And maybe I said, oh, this is a good taste. So this is how essentially how our life is. All the karma fall comes to us, the effects of actions. We voluntarily choose to eat it. And the example given in the Upanishads, you might remember those of some of you, that of the bird eating the fruits from a tree. Because some fruits are sweet, some are bitter. Nobody's forcing the bird to eat anything. The bird can simply sit without eating. In fact, this bird, lower bird, does see one bird right on the top of a tree, just sitting there, not eating anything, filled with light. And he says, oh, let me go closer. That bird looks so peaceful. Kind of goes a few branches ahead, up, upward, again finds a few fruit, again feels tempted. And that's essentially what is being said here. So forsaking the clinging to fruits of action really means even though all this karma fall will be right in front of me, can I resist the temptation to grab it? That's the idea. Ever, and that will happen only when I'm completely satisfied. Nitya triptaha. Tripti. Tripti means you have had a heavy meal, a really, really heavy meal that you can't then eat anything more. And after that, some, somebody brings some delicious dish again and says, come on, try this. I said, no, I'm sorry. I'm so full. I won't be able to have anything at all. Can we reach that state? If the complete nitya triptaha, that completely ever satisfied, then no matter what nature presents before us, we'll say, no, 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 I'm full. Right now, we, we feel just the opposite. We feel incomplete. That's why purna madhav purna midam. It's full there, it's full here. But right now, our condition is apurna madhav, apurnam. Everything is incomplete. Hence the desire to want things. Because somehow I feel, oh, this is something I lack. If only I get that thing, then I, all my life will be completely. And that's that's the kind of a consumeristic society we live. The, the All the advertisements and everything are meant to make us feel that your life is incomplete unless and until you buy this product. Only if you buy this, then all your problems will be solved. And of course, we know that no matter how many things we get, it somehow never gets filled up. We never feel completely satisfied. Depending on nothing, though engaged only such a person, when such a person is engaged in action, they are not doing anything really means they are not bound by whatever the karma fall is issued from that action. Verse 21. Nirashir yatachit tatma 
ವ್ಯಕ್ತ ಸರ್ವಪರಿಗ್ರಹ ಶಾರೀರ ಕೇವಲ ಕರ್ಮ ಕುರುವನ್ನಾಪ್ನೋತಿ ಕಿಲ್ ಬಿಷಂ ವಿದೌಟ್ ಹೋಪ್ ದ ಬಾಡಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ಪೊಸೆಷನ್ಸ್ ರೆಲಿಂಕ್ವಿಸ್ಟ್ ಹಿ ಡಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಸಫರ್ ಎನಿ ಈವಿಲ್ ಕಾನ್ಸಿಕ್ವೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಬೈ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಮಿಯರ್ ಬಾಡಿಲಿ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಸೊ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಲಿವ್ ದಟ್ ವೇ ಸೊ ಸಬ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಕರ್ಮ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಬಾಂಡೇಜ್ but it's not karma itself is not a bondage the bondage is the sense of being a karta that i am the doer the idea that i am the agent of action that is a bondage because i mean action is being done i mean even for instance any machine does a lot of action also a machine doesn't get bound because machine doesn't have the sense of i but we get bound we get bound by our sense of i that i am doing this and i need to be compensated for it i need to get to be rewarded for what i do that's the bondage verse 22 yadrichha labha santushto dvandva tito vimatsarah samasiddha vasiddhau cha kritva pina nibadhyate content with what comes to him without effort unaffected by the pairs of opposites free from envy even minded in success and failure though acting he is not bound and as i said when we read verses like this in the gita we have to rephrase them in the mind it apparently seems like krishna is speaking about some unspecified person who is content with what comes and unaffected etc and that person is not bound but when you and i read this words what we should read is if i don't want to be bound myself then i should try to be content with whatever comes to me i should try to remain unaffected by the pairs of opposites i should be free from envy i should try to be even minded in success and failure when i am able to fulfill these conditions then even when i am in the thick of action even when i am busy doing things i will not feel a sense of bondage so whenever we feel stressed by the work that we do we get exhausted physically exhausted mentally exhausted emotionally exhausted and sometimes we blame the work or we blame the work environment we blame lot of other things but actually it is these things if i can fulfill these conditions then no matter where i work i can still be completely happy and contented so the external work conditions might seem to have a lot of effect and maybe partially a little bit they do but mostly it's our internal conditions that are the major problem as we go about and navigate our way through life 23 gata sangasya muktasya jnana vasthita chetasah yajnaya acharata karma samagram pravilyate devoid of attachment liberated with mind centered in knowledge performing work for yajna alone his whole karma dissolves away again as i said translate it in your mind that if i want all my karma to be dissolved away i should be devoid of attachment i should i should have my mind centered in knowledge and do my work for yajna alone so beginning with this verse and several verses that follow there is this whole idea about yajna now it's a very big subject and um, there is a lot to reflect on this we can do some amount of reading about this sacrifice as it is often times translated but we have to recognize that understanding what yajna is is not simply an intellectual process that we get some kind of a clarity by reading about it and reflecting upon it but 
to understand exactly what yajna is, it somehow comes only through our own experience. So intellectual understanding, clarity is good. But as we try to live according to whatever our understanding is, our understanding deepens through our direct experience with things in life. Now, a very brief background. Normally, when we use the word yajna, for most people, what immediately comes before the mind, kind of a fire sacrifice. There is a havana, homakunda, there is this big fire going, and then there are oblations done into it and offerings made into the fire. And that's the kind of the ritualistic form of yajna that oftentimes, at least in my mind, whenever I heard from childhood the word yajna, that is what came before mine. So, yes, that is definitely one way the process of yajna manifests. But what is it really? So, one way of understanding that is in the Vedas, there is this word called rhythm. Rhythm really stands for the Vedic Rishi saw that the essential nature of reality is harmony. There is this complete balance and that harmony and balance is, is a state of complete peace and transcendence. Now, the creation of the world in which we live, the world is already polarized. And by polarized, I mean, it's a world that is made up of these pairs of opposites. And we see that in the second chapter of the Gita, when Krishna speaks about matras, parshas, to kaunteya, shitoshna, sukha, dukha, daha. So sukha, dukha, Shita, Ushna, cold, heat, joy, sorrow, love, hate, all these pairs of opposites, all these polarities exist in the world in which we live. And every one of us stands somewhere on the spectrum with regard to these polarities. And there is this pulls and tensions from both sides. With the result that we have lost that sense of harmony, the rhythm, the world, the cosmic world order, because we have fallen down from that state of consciousness. And that's why most religious traditions have this idea and is expressed oftentimes through stories, through myths, the idea of the fall, that at some stage of life, Somewhere, things were perfect. Everything was wonderful. And then something happened. And, and, and somehow we lost that intrinsic sense of purity and harmony. In, in Christianity, we often seek about the paradise, the Garden of Eden, when God first created the world. And everything was completely perfect there. Until... The forbidden tree, the snake, the fruit that was eaten, and then come up the firstborn, the Adam and Eve fell into this world of tension of the good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil, the polarities immediately appeared. Now, the same similar concepts exist in pretty much most religious traditions. The in the Vedas, we see that the state of perfection, so to speak, that ideal state or that state of harmony. And a fall from that state of harmony is in this world in which we live. So the goal, one way of defining the goal before us, if we want to uh, recover or reclaim that harmony within us, we have to raise our consciousness back to that level. And one way of looking at that is through cosmic sacrifice. Now, in the, in the Vedas, there is one 
sukta called the purusha sukta which is essentially the the cosmic sacrifice the sacrifice of the supreme being so this that section of the vedas describes that this whole creation itself has come as a result of the 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 supreme being was sacrificed and that's how from the different limbs of that supreme being that purusha all these different parts of the universe emerged and so and that is not something that is a one time event that it's some and some prehistoric time it happened that's continuously happening and so the world in which we live has come as a result of that sacrifice to supreme being now to the extent we are able to recreate that in our own life through our own sacrifice we are then able to raise our consciousness to that higher consciousness the transcendent consciousness of the supreme being and that's how just as the supreme one sacrificed in order to make this creation possible and and not just make it possible and just kind of left it to its own devices what we see is that everything that happens in the world there is a certain order to it yeah, and and we referred to it briefly yesterday about the 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 cycle the climate cycle the 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 rivers the water how it sustains life air energy all these huge resources are kind of working in some order mutually supplementing one another we know that even a little bit something changes i mean sometimes people who are don't think a lot about it when people speak about uh climate change and they say well in the next 50 or 100 years the temperature of the planet i'm just kind of throwing out some numbers the actual numbers might be different it's that oh the the mean temperature of the planet is increased by 1 degree let's say and most people are like oh 1 degree big deal it's it's nothing what they don't realize is even that much of a change at the planetary level has enormous consequences we know about the the melting of the of the at the at the poles north pole and south pole and how i mean i'm not i'm not an expert in this field so i'm not able to reel out all these statistics but but a lot of major changes are occurring how it affects vegetation how it affects forests how it's going to affect not only climate although we say climate change but climate change is going to affect farming the supply of food if food supply changes or diminished or we are not able to grow the things we depend on it's overall going to help affect the health of human beings it's it's catastrophic it kind of starts with just like oh just a 1 degree change in the temperature so everything is connected and everything depends on one another so that is the idea of yajna it's not sometimes we think about yajna is like just offering putting things in fire but it's not just giving it's also receiving it's it's a circular movement and that happens in our lives as well we can see that no matter how much some of us might think that i am a self made person i did everything on my own none of us is self made we all are dependent on lot of things outside a uh, a uh, a human baby is the most helpless creature especially immediately after birth if there were no people around to take care of a baby after its birth the baby won't be able to survive in fact some of the young ones of animals become self reliant much quicker than the young ones of human beings and so whatever we have attained in life today there is so many people have worked hard behind it even for our physical survival our parents and the elders in the family 
the the education the love the friendship we have got from friends from our teachers from from our a well, lot of people in our lives all that has contributed for me to being who i am today and so the only way to then acknowledge that is to then return the idea is it's 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 things come to us for instance nature nature gives us water air things for our physical sustenance but from the universe we also get love understanding friendship knowledge information now i'm getting all these things and if someone says oh i'm just going to take all this thing but i'm not going to give anything to anybody it just for myself and that's what then krishna says uh, in this section on the yajna if someone says i'm just going to keep everything for myself such a person is not only bringing a lot of suffering and pain upon themselves but but such a person is completely deluded and the truth is that even if we want to keep anything for ourselves we won't be able to at the very least when we die we cannot take anything with us when we come into this world we come with nothing when we die we go with nothing so no matter how much everybody would want to hold on to it nature at one point will say you you it'll kind of snatched away from me and so the wisdom lies if it's going to go anyway whether i like it or not to give it willingly to give it joyfully at least i will spare my spare myself from the pain and suffering that comes along with that and so yajna at the individual level means i will continue to receive things from the world but then i will pass it on non retention not keeping anything for myself i will i'll just as i have received love and friendship from others i will give love and friendship to other people whatever i have received i will give so that is essentially what yajna is participating consciously now as i said nature is we are just parts at at our physical and mental level we are just parts of this world parts of this whole material universe and whether we like it or not the universe is far bigger than any of us it will it it can do whatever it wants and we cannot stop it from doing all that is within our power is are we going to do it willingly joyfully or we or we are going to just kicking and screaming nature will have to snatch it away from us that's the choice we have so the verses that go ahead go forward from here when they discuss about yajna so keep this kind of a general background at the back of your mind look at verse <clears throat> 24 it's probably the verse that most ramakrishna devotees chant to most among the entire gita brahmarpanam brahma kavi brahmagnau brahmana hutam brahmaiva tena gantavyam brahma karma samadhina the process is brahman the clarified butter is brahman offered by brahman in the fire of brahman by seeing brahman in action he reaches brahman alone <clears throat> as you can see there is no reference to food anywhere in this uh, but it's it's a verse that he chanted in all vedanta centers before every meal and the idea is simply this that just as in a <clears throat> ritualistic worship while apparently there are these different things there is a there is a setup where the fire is built then there is a person who is offering these oblations then there are the oblation themselves then there are certain specific kind of spoons that are used to put the oblation now all these are different things now what this verse says is everything involved into that ritual is nothing but the same reality same brahman so the fire is brahman 
the one who is offering it is Brahman, the instrument used is Brahman, one who recognizes that is truly free, is truly free. That's the kind of a yajna. And, and therefore, this principle is applied to the act of eating. That there is food in front of me, there is me who is eating it, there is the act of eating as well. And so the reason this is chanted before meals is, if before I start the meal, I consciously acknowledge the fact that the same divine reality is in the food that is being eaten, is in the process of eating, the one who is eating is just this one reality. It's a reminding oneself that this process is just the same presence of Brahman. And that's the idea. <clears throat> and this applies not just to food, as I said. Every action that we do, and in that action, every whatever instruments we use to recognize the same divine being present in all of them. In fact, in at different points in, in different parts of India, uh, in in this in this um south there is there is a there is a puja they often call ayudha puja uh, the all the instruments that are used in any uh, sphere of activity are ritually worshipped once once a year um it it and it's done in different times of the year in different in different communities but the idea is to see that god is not simply somewhere up above and a transcendent being that God is implicitly present all around us. And through these rituals is a periodic reminder to ourselves of the presence of God around us. And that's the idea here. Then verses 25 to 30 are these different kinds of yajnas that are described here. I won't go into too many details, but now you have a background. So I'll just read the verses here. Daivameva pare yajnam Yoginav paryupasate, Brahmagnau apare yadnyam, yadne naivo pachuvhati. Some yogis perform sacrifices to devas alone, while others offer the self as sacrifice by the, by the self in the fire of Brahman alone. Just one note sometimes these different sacrifices are categorized into at least three different categories. One is called Dravya Yajna, that is offering of some material things. In the ritual worship, it could be ghee, sometimes bilva leaves, sometimes flowers, or sometimes food as well. So that is Dravya Yajna. Jnana Yajna, so some of these things mentioned here are, are Jnana Yajna. And it really means offering, in fact, you could say that um, trying to remember that God is present in every action. Or many of the karma yoga practices come into that jnana yajna. That seeing the divine in the person that is in front of me, I try to help that person. So I'm using the awareness, the acknowledgement of the presence of God and trying to then offer it into the divine in my own heart. So it's sometimes called atma yajna or uh, jnana yajna. And a third kind of yajna is this, the I think it's probably I think it's called if I'm, if I'm correct, I think it's called Brahma yajna which really means offering my own self the, the individualized self into Brahman, the supreme self. So you'll find these different kind of yajnas mentioned here in the Verses 25 to 30. Shrotra dini indriyani anye sanyam agnishu juhati. Shabda din vishayan anya indriya agnishu juhati. Some again offer hearing and other senses as sacrifice in the fire of control, while others offer sound and other sense objects as sacrifice in the fire of the senses. These are all jnana yajnas. Sarvani indriya karmani, prana karmani chapare, atmasai yama yogagnau, juvati jnana deepite, 
Some again offer all the actions of senses and the functions of the vital energy as sacrifice in the fire of control in the cell, kindled by knowledge. And then you might, he mentions all these other yajnas here in verse 28. Dravya yajna stapo yajna, yoga yajna statha pare, swadhyaya jnana yajna scha, yataya samshita vrataha. Others again offer wealth, austerity and yoga as sacrifice, while still others of self-restraint and rigid vows offer study of the scriptures and knowledge as sacrifice. So, look at look at verse thirty. Sarve pyete yadnya vidaha yadnya kshapita kalmashaha yadnya shishta mrita bhujo yanti brahmasanatanam nayam lokostya yadnya sya kutonya kuru sattama. All of these are knowers of yadnya, having their sins consumed by yadnya and eating of the nectar, the remnant of yajna, they go to the eternal Brahman. Even this world is not for the non-performer of yajna, how then another or best of the Kurus. So, don't worry too much if these last five or six verses, if everything doesn't make complete sense to you. It doesn't make complete sense to me either. And part of the reason is, a lot of these practices now are not a part of our daily practice ourselves. At one time, Krishna's time during 3,000 years ago, I think probably these things made better sense because these were more current at that time. And so this is not necessary that we have to say, well, how should I make an offering of this in my own life? All that we need to, the, the summary, the essence of this is that nature in many different ways has given us a lot of things. And that has enriched us, that has helped us grow, that has helped us become mature, that has made us be who we are now. What our duty is that whatever we have received from outside, I need to pass it on. And in one way or the other, we, most of us do it. The, whatever parents learn from their parents, they pass it on to their children. And those children will then pass it on to their children. So in some spheres of life, we are already participating in this kind of a yajna that is occurring. Now, can we extend that and even include in those things, the things we may not have thought before. For instance, some people might say, oh, I don't want to have be, uh, I don't want, I don't like to be friendly with anyone. I don't find the need to love anyone. But then if we become conscious of the fact, how much love I have received in my life myself, how much friendship of others has been to me, so if that's what I have received, then in some form, in some way, that power of friendship, that energy of friendship should go out from me in some way. And that's, that being conscious of that, that is what yajna really means. So I think that is a kind of a general summary of many of these verses, that whatever we have, is something that has come to us from the larger creation. And we have to be the, the conduits through which it is returned back. And, and it's a little bit like, suppose there is a fresh air you get if you open your windows. Then you say, oh, it's a fresh air now. I don't want to share this fresh air with anyone. I'm going to close my windows and make it airtight. And then I don't want to share this. After some time, that air inside is no longer going to remain fresh. And I'm, I'm going to suffer and I'm, I'm not going to learn anything. But if I keep my windows open, fresh air will keep and I can then pass on. It can go out and then shoot. So this free flow of not just air, but energy, love, all the positive things, 
And the responsibility is this. We can also be a kind of refineries, if you like. For instance, many of these oil refineries, what they get is crude oil. But what these refineries do is that they purify that oil and make it then ready for use, whether it's in cars or in aeroplanes and other places where they need even more refined oil. Can we become refineries like that? Otherwise, people can say, oh, I've received so much hatred from others. Well, let me pass on that hatred and hate other people. That's a problem. Now, if I become kind of a refinery and say, yes, maybe hatred has come to me. Unpleasantness has come to me from outside. Can I refine it inside? And then pass out pleasantness, pass out love from, from within me. That is also a form of service. Sometimes we just understand service in a very kind of a crude sort of way. That, oh, only if there is a hungry person and I feed that hungry person, I'm done service. And that's true. That is service, no doubt. And that's a service that we can see and understand and appreciate. But this is kind of a silent service, which is which will never be recognized. You will never make headlines. You won't get any rewards for this. But if all the negative things that have the world has thrown at me, if I am able to process them inside and send back to the world, hatred may come to me, I will return it as love. Enmity will come to me from outside, I will return it as friendship. We may not realize this, but, but this is a service. And more the number of people start doing like this, that is a better way, a kind of a more sure way of bringing peace than just kind of sitting for negotiations for peace. And people who are sitting for negotiation are themselves are not peace with themselves. And they have so much anger and hatred inside. How can they bring peace? And so I'm not saying one shouldn't negotiate, of course. I mean, everything has a place in life. But also to recognize even as individuals, it is possible for us to do good to the world in a silent sort of way. And that, that is something Swami Vivekananda once said that that is quite possible that there are lots of people who are spiritually enlightened in the world, in every generation, in every society, but we probably may not hear anything about them. They don't write books. They don't give lectures. They don't conduct retreats over Zoom. But maybe they have had all these enlightenment in some, on some mountaintop in a cave. And nobody even knows about it. But Swamiji says they can sit there in that cave and think five good thoughts for the world. And those thoughts will live. Those thoughts will travel. And people who are receptive to those thoughts, we will catch them and we'll be inspired by them. And sometimes that happens to us. Sometimes let's say we are in a very bad mood or something feeling very depressed and something happens and we suddenly feel happy. We feel at peace. We feel cheerful. We get a new idea. And people want to take immediately credit for it. Oh, how brilliant I am. I'm a genius. I got this idea. We don't know. Maybe someone sitting somewhere in some cave sent out this brilliant thought for peace and love. And I was lucky enough to have caught that and being benefited by it. So a lot of good things happening to us may be the result of someone sending out these thoughts. And we can do the same. And that's why in many of the meditation that the Buddha taught, one of the things is always very inspiring to me. And he says, you sit and send currents of love to the east, to the west, to the north and to the south. Now this might seem to be, oh, just kind of a feel good kind of a thing. No, it's more than that. If, if, if that 
feeling that that sense of true love and understanding comes from my heart and I consciously send it out in different directions before I sit for my prayer or meditation, that is not simply a feel-good thing. It's actually thoughts are tangible, not as tangible as the material body, but thoughts are tangible. And unbeknownst to us, they may go and help someone somewhere, just as we ourselves have often been benefited by these kind of thoughts, often not knowing from where they came. So I will, I will just conclude uh, by just kind of a brief anecdote that I have mentioned several times before, but it always, it always I find it very inspiring. So this is about the British author, his name is W. H. Auden. And he, he had moved to New York and I think he, set, he settled down uh, in, in the United States. So in his life, it is said that when he was still fairly young, and one day he became extremely depressed. And he said he decided to end his life. He was in New York. He went to the Brooklyn. He was, I think, probably living in Brooklyn. He went to the Brooklyn Bridge. And he said, he decided, I'm going to jump and end my life. And he went almost like to like past midnight. There's hardly anybody on the street. He walked to the Brooklyn Bridge. He climbed up and was about to jump. At that time, a big truck passed by. A 16 or 24 wheeler truck passed by. And because the road was empty, and oftentimes these truckers, these big tr truckers, they kind of go at night because it's much easier to, to go long distances with these heavy vehicles. And so the driver was driving that truck. He was, he was just singing joyfully. You know, he was... Yeah, for whatever reason, a joyfully singing, and he had, he wasn't even aware there was this somebody on the sidewalk about to jump into the river. He had no idea. So he just passed by, and this author was about to jump. He heard this joyful, cheerful song of this passing truck. And the truck went, and then he, something struck him. And then he says, there is such a thing as hope in this world. There is joy. It's not all a very dark, depressing picture. And he says, he quietly withdrew and walked back to his apartment and never again in his life thought of taking his own life. And then he writes, he said, maybe that truck driver had no idea and will never know that he actually saved the life. We don't know if we are cheerful, happy, smiling, then not only are we benefiting ourselves, but unbeknownst to us, we may be benefiting many other people as well. And we may never know. And the flip side of that is, if I'm angry, filled with hate and all negativities, not only I'm hurting myself, but maybe someone who is cheerful, I may spoil that person's mood and make someone else depressed as well. So by allowing the negativity in my heart, I'm hurting myself and I'm also doing some harm to the world. By spreading this, one day Swami Vivekananda in his Raja Yoga lecture, Swamiji says, if some days you are feeling miserable and angry, don't go out that day. Just stay in your room. You have no right to spread this disease to the world. <laughs> and so we have to recognize that, that if by being, and that's why Swamiji, that other quote, is I, it's, it's so fascinating. Swamiji says, by being cheerful always and smiling, it takes you nearer to God, nearer than any prayer. So, being happy and cheerful and loving are not just just kind of a, a, the tips that we often hear people give, but they actually have very concrete effect on our spiritual life. By being happy, cheerful, contented, we are benefiting ourselves 
And unbeknownst to us, we are benefiting people around us. But by be doing the opposite things, we are hurting ourselves and we are hurting the people around us. So lots of ideas to discuss. We haven't finished the entire chapter and we don't need to. That was not the goal in itself. But at least some of the important ideas that came in this chapter four, um, we kind of very briefly took a look at it. And uh, of course, Gita is one text that we study so often, and I'm sure all of you have taken a look at it, where we heard talks and studied it on your own many times before, and you will do so in the future as well. Uh, and so let's keep on studying this. Let's and not just studying it, not simply as an intellectual food, but whatever from these texts makes sense to us, let us try as much as possible to, to live according to this teaching. Because only, as Swamiji says, an ounce of practice is worth tons of theory. And so with all these ideas, we can keep on talking about it endlessly. But ultimately, what will make a difference in our life, a real difference in our life, is if we can make an effort to live according to these teachings. Again, not blindly. Try to understand if it resonates with you, if this makes sense to you, then try to live according to it. Trying, making an effort to live this way, even if imperfectly, is better than not making that effort at all. And so, yeah, that's the thought. So what do you, if you have any comments and ideas, to share, feel free to do so. Today is our last time we are meeting this. So if you if you want to say something that you have not said before, this is your chance. <laughs> Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Just mention, but you don't have to do anything. You skipped 4.17, the 17th shloka, but that's quite okay. Yeah, I've skipped many actually. So, no, but, yeah. but anyway, my question was regarding the first shloka today, 19th. You said that Kama Sankalpa Varjita means let the God's will prevail or God's wish prevail. So, how does one, how does one, uh, be so so uh, sensitive to God's will. Won't we mistake it for our will sometimes? Say that again. Okay, for nineteen, the nineteen shloka. Yeah, you. It was a whose all whose work is without any desire and uh, sankalp uh, and. Then, then, etc. He is wise, and there you said that uh, not my desire, my sankar, but God's desire, God's sankar. Mm -hmm. So the uh, question always is, how does one reflect God's desire, God's sankar, and not confuse in some ways or hide in some ways our own desire, own sankar? Yes, I mean, that's true. Now, we have. We don't know what God's will is, but we know that whatever happens, happens due to God's will. And so whatever is happening around us is neither your will nor my will, it's God's will. But it's true, as long as we have the ego, we have our own little will as well. And so it's easy to say, have no will of your own. And that will happen when our ego will completely disappear. But right now, we have our ego. And therefore, we have our own will as well. And so, a more practical thing, at least in our present state of development, would be, first of all, to transform our ego into a ripe ego. Connect our ego with God in some way, as Thakur said. And then, when we pray, 
we can pray. And actually, this, this I'm borrowing it from Thomas Kempis's The Imitation of Christ, in that he says, I love it. He says, he acknowledges, I have my will, but he says, God, make my will as close to your will as possible. Because ultimately, God's will is good, whatever is going to happen. And I don't know what God's will is. So he says, please give me enough wisdom that my will becomes as close to the divine will as it is. That's all that we can do. We can just pray. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Pranams Maharaj. Thank you for a beautiful retreat. And uh, it's it's extremely insightful to, to given that there is so Who's much. Speaking? I'm not able oh, to actually see. I'm sorry. This is Hari. Hari. Oh, Hari. Okay. Hi. Okay. Namaskar. Yeah. Pranams Maharaj. The, the, given that there is always stressors around all of us, and then the doom and gloom we hear in the media and all the, many of them may be reality, not that, you know, relative reality, but spreading the cheerfulness tremendously helps. It uplifts a, people a good deal, not only ourselves, but the surroundings. So this is extremely helpful at a practical level, what you're teaching today. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also, it's almost like, like a reverse engineering in some ways. For instance, the pranayama is a kind of a reverse engineering in a sense that at some point, some yogis saw that the connection between the states of our mind and the patterns of our breathing that how if when people are excited or angry or upset, the breathing is uneven. And how when people are at complete peace and contented, it's kind of harmonious. So this natural changes that occur in our breathing pattern and our emotions and feelings. And the reverse engine, what is done is to say, okay, if that's how my breathing pattern is when I'm peaceful and calm, let me mechanically try to make my breathing pattern that way to kind of uh, um, elicit the corresponding feeling emotion. And people have found it works. Uh, it's not like a perfect solution, but it does work. If I can then consciously, mechanically try to make my breathing as rhythmic and possible, it does have an effect of kind of calming down the people. That's why many people practice pranayama because they find it works. This is also a little bit like that because when we are happy and cheerful, there is a kind of a natural smile that occurs. And, and what is a smile other than some tiny muscles in this area are acting and then kind of... <laughs> You know, the kind of changes that normally occur in the human face. And it's a very, it's a just a physiological thing. Certain muscles get pulled and there are tensions and smile. But now that muscular movement is associated with joy and happiness. Now, when we are happy, we smile, naturally smile. We don't have to make any effort. But when we are angry or when we are depressed, it's not easy to smile. Even if we are kind of forced to smile, it's going to be a very unnatural, awkward kind of a smile. Even then it's effective. It's like if you're really mad at someone, and you feel like getting angry at them and you don't want to avoid commit making a scene, force yourself to smile. It's very difficult to be smiling and being nasty at the same time. It's very difficult to get angry and be smiling. And so it does work. So sometimes even if one is in a very bad mood, just like people do yoga stretches, this is like just stretching the muscles here. But it does work. It does work. Um, and so even if one doesn't feel like smiling, and we don't feel like smiling all the time. But if we can force ourselves to do that, um, 
it's a good thing also, especially, especially sometimes they say, and I don't know how true it is, but it feels that some, some, it feels true. And that is, they say, you know, as people age, um, we the, the, the skin is no longer as thought as it is when we are young. And so kind of wrinkles do come on the face. But everyone doesn't develop wrinkles in the same way, in the same place, in the same manner. And so it is said that whatever is our dominant expression, then that's the kind of, those are the creases where the, 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 the wrinkles will eventually come when we start getting older. So if someone is always smiling, and you can see in some older people who are always very cheerful, that the wrinkles are you know, is already, they already have, even if they're just sitting quietly, it just seems that they are very peaceful and quiet because the wrinkles have kind of taken that form. But on the other hand, if someone is like most of the time angry, then sometimes they ang they, even if they are sitting quietly, they look angry. Again, I don't know how far true this is, but it, it does feel different. So at least from that standpoint, from a purely utilitarian standpoint, it makes sense to be smiling as much as possible to get the right kind of wrinkles when we grow old. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Vidisha, let's have a closing song. Namaste, Maharaj. Can I ask a question? Or... Yeah, yeah. Yes, let's have one question. Who, who is okay, it? Okay, all right. Um, yeah. All right. Two people started asking, uh, <laughs> Sonali and then Srini. So first, Sonali, do you go ahead and okay. then Srini. We can actually it. earlier i think i think because you have probably put that focus or something earlier when somebody would ask question that square gets highlighted but here nothing happens so i'm like wondering who is asking <laughs> let me add them okay <laughs> yeah uh maharaj uh, oh. on the on the first day you uh, emphasized on the renunciation part hmm. and uh, the difficulty of renunciation. But uh, I mean, if we look around, I mean, if we are able to um, remove ourselves from ourselves and look around, I mean, renunciation to certain extent is there almost everywhere. I mean, starting from uh, the presidential position, that is also for a very limited amount of time, maximum eight years. So your fame will, uh, if you uh, get famous, your fame and your position will go away after eight years maximum. I mean, you have to renounce it. Then um, you brought in Taylor Swift. Now Taylor Swift's uh, wave is uh, uh, very strong now, but as we have seen, the wave is going to crash at some point. And uh, when she's no longer able to mind the psychology of the audience, and that happens, she's not going to be the first one. And uh, at least in the presidential case, you know, after eight years max, here she, we don't, I mean, the artists don't even know. But then again, they have to renounce that. That's the only, that's the thing we know. So, uh, I, I mean, I can go on giving examples, but uh, I mean, renunciation, if we look, it's uh, uh, there almost everywhere. And it's like an antidote to uh, not getting depressed or angry or uh, mad. <laughs> so, yeah, but we have to remove ourselves from ourselves and look outside to see it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the realities of existence is nothing is permanent. Everything, everything goes away. And which is why when things go away, we don't have to be surprised or upset or angry because nothing is permanent. The only thing 
that never goes away is the divine. Other than that, everything will be taken away. And so that's why a bhakta, a devotee, a spiritual seeker will say, I am going to hold on to God. Or subjectively, I am going to hold on to the spirit, the Atman. Because that is the only thing no one can ever take away. No one can take away me from me. Everything else which is mine can be taken away from me. And whatever is taken away, can be taken away from me, is not me. Death, body will, Yamaraj will come and take away my body. That's not me. And so, whether we like it or not, everything will, will get renounced. Nature will snatch it away. And so, therefore, we should, we should just hold on to something that cannot be taken away. Yes. Namaste Maharaj. Um, I think um, the day before yesterday, um, you did talk about on the verse 8, Dharma Samstapana, uh, uh, Sambhavami Uge Uge, restoration of the Dharma. Um, how da Because the, the beginning of the chapter 4 begins with uh, the avatara, explaining the avatara, the reason for the reincarnation. And then um, we get into the selfless action um, in the verses, maybe in the starting from after that. So how do we relate that actually? Because establishment of righteousness um, and um, the selfless action. Um, so can we think of that as basically Lord incar incarnates as the avatara to show us an example or lead by example and that's the reason why that particular verse 8 of avatara appears in the karma yoga but not in the gnana yoga or the bhakti yoga chapter 12 or maybe other chapters is that the reason or i'm, I'm no, trying no. to make a connection there actually yeah but i mean when krishna taught arjuna the gita he did not teach through chapters you see i mean this is yeah. the much later thing so whether it comes in this chapter or that chapter, I, I don't think it's so much. I, I don't think it, it matters so much. Okay. Yeah. Pranam Maharaj. Ah, Karo. Hari Narayana Sare Neda Neda Sare Sare Ramana, 
त्याज खुसंग त्याज खुसंग सतसंग बैठानी त हरे चरचा सुनो दीजे मनो हरे चरचा सुनो दीजे काम क्रोध मदनो काम क्रोध काम क्रोध मदनो so thanks everyone um it was a great joy as always to 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 spend some time even if virtually and hopefully uh, maybe next year we might meet in person uh, if all goes well so we'll see so what's the next thing uh, next retreat will be when not mine so at the, at the pitspark ashram maybe march maharaj this will be the last one for this year or oh, in winter, winter everybody great, needs great some rest. One. yeah okay that's good all right so so much maharaj is a bonus retreat for us uh, thank you maharaj acharya <laughs> om shanti 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 hari hi om namaskar namaskar acharya acharya